Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming out tonight. My name is Bex. I am on the events team here at Books Are Magic, and we're so excited to celebrate wellness. Um, so we're here tonight with Nathan Hill, of course, and um, it's editor Reagan, Reagan Arthur. Sorry. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to point out some logistics for tonight's event. Um, we'll be doing a hand-raised Q&A um, with the audience afterwards. So if you have questions that come up, keep them, and then raise your hand when we tell you to. Um, after the talk, Nathan will be signing and personalizing books at the back. And when that time comes for that, we'll like let you know how to line up and do it. If you haven't already bought a book, we've got so many books. It's great. Buy a book for yourself, for your friends, for your neighbors, for your pets, for anyone. Um, if you're on the live stream, you can buy a book in the description. Um, so, Wellness, tonight's star of the show, is a novel that travels from the gritty 90s Chicago art scene to a suburbia of detox diets and home renovation hysteria. When Jack and Elizabeth meet as college students, they quickly join forces and thrive as kindred spirits. Fast forward 20 years into marriage, and we see how they must undertake separate personal excavations or risk losing the best thing in their lives, each other. Wellness, Hill's second novel, reimagines the love, of st the love story with a healthy dose of insight, irony, and heart. Our owner, Mike, adores it. Um, glowing reviews. So <laughs> glowing. we love glowing reviews. Um, and so we've got Nathan here. Nathan's best-selling debut novel, The Knicks, was named the number one book of 2016 by Entertainment Weekly and one of the year's best books by The New York Times, The Washington Post, NPR, Slate, and many others. It was the winner of the art... Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction from the Los Angeles Times and was published worldwide in more than two dozen languages. A native Iowan, he lives with his wife in Naples, Florida. <laughs> Reagan Arthur joined Knopf as a publisher in early 2020 after 19 years at Little Brown. Writers she's edited include Kate Atkinson, Tina Fey, Rachel Cusk, Ellen Hildebrand, Joshua Ferris, George Pelicanos, Ian McEwen, Attica Locke, and Megan Abbott, and so many more. It's an honor to have them both here tonight without any further delay. Please welcome and joining Nathan and Reagan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for, wow, thanks for coming out, everybody. It's like a gorgeous night out there, and I'm fully aware that you could be like, I don't know, throwing a Frisbee or playing with your dog in a park or something like that. And instead, you're in a bookstore with us. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry I was a little late. I went to the other location. <laughs> and like I was I was getting into an Uber to come to the right location and I actually saw a guy walking past the other location with my book in his hand and <laughs> like I was going to invite him to the car but we had no room. <laughs> so I hope I, I don't see him. Oh, he's <laughs> he's he's on his way. He's like running over. Um uh, thanks for coming everybody. Uh, I thought I would read the first chapter of the book kind of appropriately because I, I wrote this originally when I first lived here. So I moved to New York City in 2004 for the first time, like after finishing my MFA program. And I was living in a, uh, a, a studio apartment in Astoria, Queens. Uh, and my little apartment had one little window and it looked out onto this wall of other windows, like a brick wall with other, other windows, other apartments. And, you know, it was a tough time for me. I was kind of feeling a little lonely. And I just had this, like, vision of these two lonely people, like, looking out their windows, catching glimpses of each other. Um, and slowly, very slowly, over the winter, falling kind of in love with each other. And I wrote that as a short story, published it, moved on, didn't think about it for another 15 years, and then came back to it when I was writing this book. So I thought I'd read that first story, and maybe later we'll talk about like the 15-year gap between chapter one and chapter two. So this is the first chapter of Wellness. He lives alone on the fourth floor of an old brick building with no view of the sky. When he looks out his window, all he can see is her window. Across the alley, an arm's length away, where she lives alone on the fourth floor of her own old building. They don't know each other's names. They have never spoken. It is winter in Chicago. Barely any, any light enters the narrow alley between them, and barely any rain either, or snow, or sleet, or fog, or that crackling wet January stuff the locals call wintry mix. The alley is dark and still and without weather. It seems to have no atmosphere at all, a hollow stitched into the city for the singular purpose of separating things from things, like outer space. She first appeared to him on Christmas Eve. He'd gone to bed that night, 
feeling horribly sorry for himself, the only soul in his whole raucous building with nowhere else to be, when a light snapped on across the alley, and a small warm glow replaced his window's usual yawning dark. He sat up, walked to the window, peeked out. There she was, a flurry of movement, arranging, unpacking, pulling small vibrant dresses from large matching suitcases. Her window was so close to him, and she was so close to him, their apartment separated by the distance of a single ambitious jump that he scooted back a few feet to more fully submerge himself in his darkness. He sat there on his heels and stared for a short while until the staring felt improper and indecent, and he contritely returned to bed. But he has, in the weeks since, come back to the theater of this window, and more often than he'd like to admit, he sometimes sits here, hidden, and, for a few minutes at a time, he watches. To say that he finds her beautiful is too simple. Of course he finds her beautiful, objectively, classically, obviously beautiful. Even just the way she walks, with a kind of buoyancy, a cheerful, jaunty bounce, has him thoroughly charmed. She glides across the floor of her apartment in thick socks, occasionally doing an impromptu twirl, the skirt of her dress billowing briefly around her. In this drab and filthy place, she prefers dresses, bright flowered sundresses, incongruous amid the grit of this neighborhood, the cold of this winter. She tucks her legs under them as she sits in her plush velvet armchair, a few candles glowing nearby, her face impassive and cool, holding a book in one hand, the other hand idly tracing the lip of a wine glass. He watches her touch that glass and wonders how a little fingertip can inspire such a large torment. Her apartment is decorated with postcards from places he assumes she's been, Paris, Venice, Barcelona, Rome, and framed posters of art he assumes she's seen in person, the Statue of David, the Pietà, the Last Supper, Guernica. Her tastes are manifold and intimidating. Meanwhile, he's never even seen an ocean. She reads inordinately at all hours, flicking on her yellow bedside lamp at two o'clock in the morning to page through large and unwieldy textbooks, biology, neurology, psychology, microeconomics, or various stage plays or collections of poetry or thick histories of wars and empires or scientific journals with inscrutable names and bland gray bindings. She listens to music he assumes is classical for the way her head sways to it. He strains to identify book jackets and album covers, then rushes to the public library the next day to read all the authors that rouse and unsleep her, and listen to all the symphonies she seems to have on repeat, the Hofner, the Arabica, the New World, the Unfinished, the Fantastique. He imagines that if they ever actually speak, he will drop some morsel of symphony fantastique knowledge and she will be impressed with him and fall in love. If they ever actually speak. She's exactly the kind of person, cultured, worldly, that he came to this frighteningly big city to find. The obvious flaw in the plan, he realizes now, is that a woman so cultured and worldly would never be interested in a guy as uncultured, as provincial, as backward and coarse as him. Only once has he seen her entertain a guest, a man. She spent an appalling amount of time in the bathroom before he arrived and tried on six dresses, finally picking the tightest one, a purple one. She pulled her hair back, she put on makeup, washed it off, put it back on, she took two showers, she looked like a stranger. The man arrived with a six pack of beer and they spent what seemed like an awkward and humorless two hours together. Then he left with a handshake, he never came back. Afterward, she changed into a ratty old t-shirt and sat around all evening eating cold cereal in a fit of private sloth. She didn't cry, she just sat there. He watched her across their oxygenless alley, thinking that she was, in this moment, beautiful, though that word beautiful seems su suddenly too narrow to contain the situation. Beauty has both public and private faces, he thought, and it is difficult for one not to annul the other. He wrote her a note on the back of a Chicago postcard, you would never have to pretend with me. Then he threw it away and tried again. You would never have to be someone trying to be someone else. But he didn't send them. He never sends them. Sometimes her apartment is dark, and he go to, goes about his night, his ordinary hermetic night, wondering where she might be. That's when she's watching him. She sits at her window in the darkness, and he cannot see her. She studies him, 
observes him, notes his stillness, his tranquility, the admirable way he sits cross-legged on his bed and persistently for hours just reads. He is always alone in there, his apartment, a desolate little box of unadorned white walls and a cinder block bookshelf and a futon condemned to the floor, is not a home that anticipates guests. Loneliness, it seems, holds him like a buttonhole. To say that she finds him handsome is too simple. Rather, she finds him handsome insofar as he seems unaware that he could be handsome. A dark goatee obscuring a delicate baby face, big sweaters disguising a waifish body. His hair is a few years past clean cut and now falls in oily ropes over his eyes and down to his chin. His fashions are fully apocalyptic, threadbare black shirts and black combat boots and dark jeans in urgent need of patching. She's seen no evidence that he owns a single necktie. Sometimes he stands in front of the mirror shirtless, ashen, disapproving. He is so small, short and anemic and skinny as an addict. He survives on cigarettes and the occasional meal, boxed and plastic wrapped and microwavable usually, or sometimes powdered and rehydrated into borderline edible things. Witnessing this makes her feel as she does while watching reckless pigeons alight on the L's deadly electrified lines. He needs vegetables in his life. Potassium and iron, fiber and fructose, dense chewy grains and colorful juices. All the elements and elixirs of good health. She wants to wrap a pineapple in ribbon. She'd send it with a note, a new fruit every week. It would say, don't do this to yourself. For almost a month, she's watched as tattoos spread ivy-like across his back, now connecting in a riot of pattern and color that's migrating down his slender arms, and she thinks, I could live with that. In fact, there's something reassuring about an assertive tattoo, especially a tattoo that's visible even while wearing a collared work shirt. It speaks to a confidence of personality, she thinks, a person with the strength of his convictions, a person with convictions, contrary to her own everyday inner crisis and the question that's dogged her since moving to Chicago, who will I become? Or maybe more accurately, which of my many selves is the true one? The boy with the aggressive tattoo seems to provide a new way forward, an antidote to the anxiety of incoherence. He's an artist, that much is clear, for he can be most often found mixing paints and solvents, inks and dyes, plucking photo papers out of chemical baths, or leaning over a light box, inspecting film negatives through a small, round magnifier. She's amazed at how long he can look. He'll spend an hour comparing just two frames, staring at one, then the other, and then the first again, searching for the more perfect image. And when he's found it, he circles the frame with a red grease pencil. Every other negative is X'd out, and she applauds his decisiveness. When he chooses a picture, or a tattoo, or a certain bohemian lifestyle, he chooses devotedly. It is a quality that she, who cannot decide on even the simplest things, what to wear, what to study, where to live, whom to love, what to do with her life, both envies and covets. This boy has a mind calmed by high purpose. She feels like a bean jumping against its pod. He's exactly the kind of person, defiant, passionate, that she came to this remote city to find. The obvious flaw in the plan, she realizes now, is that a man so defiant and passionate would never be interested in a girl as conventional, as conformist, as dull and bourgeois as her. Thus, they do not speak, and the winter nights pass slowly, glacially, the ice coating tree branches like barnacles. All season, it's the same. When his light is off, he is watching her. When her light is off, she is watching him. And on, on the nights she isn't home, he sits there feeling dejected desperate, maybe even a little pathetic, and he gazes upon her window and feels like time is zipping away, opportunities gone, feeling like he is losing a race with the life he wishes he could lead. And on the nights he is at home, she sits there feeling forsaken, feeling once again so bluntly dented by the world, and she ex examines his window like it's an aquarium, hoping to see some wonderful thing erupt from the gloom. And so here they are, lingering in the shadows, Outside, the snow falls plump and quiet. Inside, they are alone in their separate little studios in their crumbling old buildings. Both their lights are off. They both watch for the other's return. They sit near their windows and wait. They stare across the alley into dark apartments, and they don't know it, but they're staring at each other. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not Anthony Mara, by the way. <laughs> he was supposed to be sitting in this stool, but he has uh, COVID. So um, the thing we have in common, uh, I, I'm not a talented writer, but we both love this book. Mm -hmm. And I will try to be slightly coherent. I'm usually sort of driven into sort of just, I don't know, paroxysms of adoration of, and excita excitement about what Nathan has done. So, um, so I made notes, so I would try and avoid that. Um, how many of you have read the book already? A lot of you. Oh my gosh. Okay. I didn't want to get into too many specifics. Not, you know. So about that last chapter. <laughs> so here's, no. Um, but I, so that's great. So we'll have a lot of good questions. Um, but not knowing if, if that would be the case, I, I wanted to keep it kind of more general in what we talked about. And I was thinking about the book and I was thinking it's, it's, it is truly a novel of ideas, I think, but it is so much also a novel about people, and I think it's very hard to find a, a book that does both. So um, I love the way that you did that. And then I was thinking about some of the ideas, which I will get to, but some of the things that are in it. And um, I don't think there's another novel in the English language that includes uh, the story of condensed milk, <laughs> 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 as well as deep and meaningful explorations of things about love and family and the internet. So I just, the details that, that you provide throughout are just fascinating. But I want to go back. Oh, you want to say something? No, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just going to listen to you all night now. And so well, <laughs> yes, I, I'm sorry. I'm just going to ho hog the mic. Um, <laughs> but uh, back to Jack and Elizabeth, who we just met. Um, you said something uh, in an interview that I thought was so fantastic and that kind of speaks to what you touched on at, th at the outset, which is, that you set out to write a love story that was about a couple but with three main characters, a husband, a wife, and time. So can you talk about that? Sure, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I, I, I came back to this, that short story. So I wrote that story, what I, what I just read to you, uh, uh, you know, um, the rough version of it when I was in my mid-20s-ish, and, and, and then came back to it uh, in my 40s after I, I'd been married for happily married for many years and uh, and it, you know had enough life under my belt to see that like these two people that I thought were so romantic when I first wrote the story were actually kind of idiots you know like <laughs> like they were inventing all of these uh, these fantasies about the other as they look at each other across the window and like and then ha you know having been in a relationship for a long time I was just like well that that has nothing to do with what what makes a marriage tick uh, and, and it, it just made me think like what would have happened to those two people and so I had this idea that I, I wanted to, to follow them to see what would have happened through time um, uh, and uh, and sort of excavate and like peel back the onion layers on these two characters about like where, where their marriage ended up and why and what they're gonna do about it so yeah I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to write this book where you got to know the, the two principal characters kind of like the way you get to know people in life which is you get to know them forwards and backwards at the same time so like you get to know them forwards by going on a date or like living with them moving you know like whatever uh, and then you get to know them backwards by like maybe you meet their parents maybe you see where they grew up you meet the friends that they had before you came along and you kind of create this synthesis of who this person is you know uh, backwards and forwards at the same time and then also you know, the, the the more you get to know someone, the deeper your connection with them, the more likely they are to reveal cer certain things, you know? I don't know if you've ever had this experience where like, you know, you feel like really close to someone, a friend, a partner or whatever, and then one night, maybe after a couple cocktails, they're like, this happened to me. And you're like, oh wow. And suddenly you see them kind of in a new light. I think we all kind of have something like that. And I wanted the experience of reading the book to feel kind of like that. You know, you kind of get to know these people, where they came from, where they're going at the same time. And as you get to know them, you kind of get deeper and deeper into their secrets. I wanted the, the reader to have that experience uh, uh, writing, or reading the book. Well, I th think so much of the book is also about stories, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, the, about w that we tell to other people, uh, the stories families tell themselves, like, oh, this is, this is who we are, and this is what we came from, and, and the lies and myths that sort of spring up around that, and then the stories that were sold, you know, in the, in the consumer, and the, just in, in, as living as m modern citizens of the world. Um, and so I thought that, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that, because I think, I feel like that's an ongoing sort of undercurrent of this, of the Yeah, novel. yeah, it is. I started thinking about this book uh, around the time, like, it was, 
like 2014, 15 ish. Do you remember this era where like people were just starting on Facebook to be kind of weird? <laughs> like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, like people that I thought were like otherwise like reasonable people started posting stuff on Facebook. I was like, what? Really? You? This is really? That's what, wow. Okay. And like, uh, and and that just kind of started happening. Um, uh, myself and all of my friends were well, all had kind of you know new life hacks that like felt like some kind of moral imperative. You know, I remember like tracking my macros. Like I was like, this is a really important thing to be doing. I do, I do need more protein in my life, you know, or whatever. Um, and w it just felt like there was, we were, we were kind of being sold a lot of stories um, that, that we were kind of taking on face value. You know, every, every listicle that was coming across my newsfeed was just like, you know, the nine, the nine ways you're living wrong. You know, it's like what you're doing wrong in the shower or before bed or what have you. And I was like, okay, we all have to do better. Um, and that was also the same time, like, you know, like my wife and I have, I think, a great origin story, like really great. Like I, she was like visiting me. We were long distance. She was visiting. She was flying up to uh, to visit me for our first date. I got into a car accident on the way to the airport. I didn't have a cell phone at the time. She was stranded at the airport. Thought I had abandoned her. The guy I hit in the car, like I convinced him to take me to the airport. I brought him into the airport with me to prove. Like it's a pretty great origin story. And then like. I remember there was this one moment when like uh, a new friend of ours had heard it so many times repeated in his presence that he just started repeating it to us. And I was like, oh my God, like we have like mythologized ourselves so much. And like we told it the same way every time. Like I would add a detail and then my wife would know to cut in with a detail. And I was like, this has just become a shtick, you know? And, and I don't know, it just gave me this idea that like that that we do this all the time. Like we have stories about, that we believe in about ourselves, about our partners, about our marriages, about our neighborhood, about our country. And, uh, and, and I was looking at the time for a container for this, this these kind of troubling feelings I was having that like we were all starting to live in different fact universes. And it, I felt like people were living in sort of delusional places and I didn't know why. And, and I was like, well, a love story is full of fantasy. It's full of delusion. So maybe I could write a love story that's kind of a Trojan horse for all these other things that I'm thinking about. I think that the um, the things that you touch on in the novel, or more than touch on, are, are, are that, well, it has a lot to do with the internet. And so, uh, you know, th th a version of that, as you said, is, you know, the, the things that people post on Facebook. And, and I was thinking about how there are stories about ourselves, like, I'm a person who has a huge TBR pile, and or I'm a person who's like, takes rugged vacations, and like, these are the more innocent, and you can, you can look at these and just uh, think you know a person, but that's just the packaging that they're presenting about themselves. And so, uh, in, in the novel, um, that's, the, that's, that's not really what you're interested in as much as the darker side of the false, the false narratives, the false sort of, the danger of that, and um, so maybe about. Yeah, I mean, in a kind of more humorous way, I was kind of thinking a little bit about like Romeo and Juliet. Like, what would happen if they didn't die at the end of the play? You know, like what would happen if like they 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 survived and they moved moved far away, and like later in life, like I don't know, like. Romeo didn't like fatherhood, you know, and like Juliet didn't like her job. And like they would look back at themselves and be like, we're freaking Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> like, like it would that story about them would sort of be constricting, right? Like they, it would it would it would not allow them if they believed in it too much. It would not allow them to kind of move forward, to evolve. And uh and I, I was uh, seeing people on Facebook who were believing stories so passionately and, uh, and outrageously even that it was that certainty. It was the, this is what the world is like and the kind of inflexibility of that that, uh, that kind of struck me. And so, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's, about, it's about stories, but like we can't, we can't avoid believing stories about ourselves or the world, you know, it's like, Psychologists call it a schema that we we all have we we understand how the world works We have a schema or a map of how the world works and like people think about like the brain is something that's good at remembering But really its primary job is to forget like think about all the things you encountered yesterday And how many of them you now remember it's like not very much right because it all just accorded to your schema And we can't remember every single detail So we have to have these stories so that we can eject things that don't accord to the, or that do accord to the story and kind of live like we're not goldfish experiencing things like 
you know, like in an, you know, in, 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 in like for the first time, you know. So we, we need these stories, but at the same time, I, I don't know, I feel like if we believe in them too hard, if we don't change them, they can also curdle into error in a way. And that's what's happening to these two, my two main characters. Like they believe this story about themselves and it's such a romantic story that they have not noticed that beneath them, the world has changed and they have changed and, and the neighborhood has changed, their lives are changed and they're still believing the story and they, they kind of need to update it. Yeah, there is, um, I'm gonna quote from the book because I, well, I'm gonna back up. So um, uh, last year we published Ian McEwan's novel, Lessons, and when Ian talked about it, and it was really, it began in childhood and took the character through to old age, and, and he talked about it as a whole life novel. And I was thinking of yours as maybe a half-life novel. If, if we're optimistic, this is that maybe the halfway point, but um, I, I think it's such a, every generation or, or every sort of age has its moment of like, now we're in our 20s and we're figuring out who we are and we're having hijinks on the weekends and finding bands we love and everything. And, and at a certain point you look up and you just think like, oh, I'm, I'm not that person anymore. Um, but I, di I didn't mean to not be that person and how did that happen? And, and you captured that I thought so perfectly when um, Elizabeth says to Jack, like life's big hard questions, what will happen? Who will I become? Have largely been answered. And now I feel like there's this huge absence where the mystery used to be. And I just thought that that hit me like a ton of bricks. And is that a question that you set out to ask or answer when you were writing this? A little bit, a little bit. Like, <clears throat> it was shocking when, when my wife and I got to a certain age that, like, <laughs> uh, uh, my wife plays in, a, in an orchestra. And there was, you know, uh, there was a, this crop of new musicians who got hired by this orchestra. And they were all uh, you know, younger, mostly, like, middle to younger millennials. And they, they came in and we were, you know, we, we, we hosted them. We had parties at our place. And at one, at one point, one of them said, gosh, you guys are just like the cool parents that I never had. And I was just like, screw you. You know, like, I guess if we had you when we were 14, then okay. But like, we, and, and, but I was just like, that is now how we're seen, you know? And, and it was a shocking moment. And I was like, but we're having parties. We're still the cool people. No, we're not the cool people. Fine. You know, and like almost against our will that it ha that it happened and and then you know like all our other friends like the people uh, that are the basically the same age as us all of our closest friends down in Florida, they all had kids at exactly the same time, and my wife and I did not. And uh, and so watching them change uh, because of that, and like just get pulled into into new directions and become radically different people, almost against their will. But uh, that was yeah, that was all on my mind as I was just w you know watching all these people. Like I don't know, you have this idea that like you know, you get to this one point in your life, like, great, now I've got everything figured out. And then like five minutes goes by and you're like, shit, you know? Yeah. Um, well, speaking of kids, I, a lot of people have remarked on how um, painfully accurate your description of uh, raising a toddler or at least living with a toddler uh, can be or, or a young person. Um, and I think any of a, if you've read it, you might relate to certain feeding scenes and others. And, um, and one of my favorite things about that is, first of all, the details themselves, but also the research you brought to bear. Um, so tell us more. Yeah, there's. if you haven't read it, there's this scene, this chapter in wellness called The Unraveling that I, I wanted to dramatize one hour of toddler childcare. And it's like 30 pages, I think. <laughs> and, um, and it's complete with... Um, with all these citations. So my character Elizabeth is like she wants all of her parenting to be informed by only the best research. And so and she's a she's a psychologist, she's a scientist. And so I got the idea that like that anytime she made a parent a parenting decision, there would be a citation that supported that decision from the 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 research literature. And uh and um and all of those citations are are true. They're all real studies. There's a giant bibliography that some people have made fun of me for, but there's a giant bibliography in the back that's mostly because of this just one chapter, um, because uh, I wanted to cite all the studies that I that I cited. And like I did that for I think two reasons, like an intellectual reason and an emotional one. The intellectual one was uh, that this is this is a book about the stories we tell ourselves, and there's you know we all kind of understand implicit uh, uh, by now like the dangers of of believing misinformation or disinformation. So Jack is a victim of misinformation because he's he's trying he's got a new fitness routine and he's believing like the the internet advice of like fitness bros who just do not know what they're talking about. So he's like that's misinformation. His father, which maybe we'll talk about this later, but is like a victim of disinformation. Like he's believing the 
the uh, the political advice of people who are like actively trying to harm him. But Elizabeth, I feel like with that chapter, I wanted to show that like not only can we be harmed by information that's false, but it's also possible to be misled by information that's true if if there's so much of it without context. And I feel like that's the information environment we're all sort of living in. We're just we have this fire hose of information coming at us, and it's really hard to contextualize any of it. Uh, and so. Uh, Elizabeth is trying to just, you know, uh, like just be a good parent and like do the stuff that's like supported by science and it's driving her crazy because there's too much of it and you cannot possibly measure up to that. So that's like the intellectual reason I wanted to write write that chapter. The emotional reason was, like I said, all of my closest friends had kids at the same time and I was watching all of them go through this and the thing that I observed was like these people were doing amazing jobs like parenthood is so hard and they were so thoughtful about it and like and putting all of their their selves into it and then i would ask them at the end of the day how's it going and they're like every night they're like i failed i'm i'm a bad parent and like there i felt like there was this disconnect where like uh, that i felt like they were doing the best they could and every day they're like I made some mistake. I shouldn't have done this. I was a little too short with my temper. Something happened that might be the thing that my kid remembers forever. That's going to screw them up forever, you know? And I just felt like, I don't know, we, 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 we live in a culture that expects too much from, from parents and places a lot of blame on mothers. And I saw that happening with my friends. And I was just like, I, I just felt for them so much. And so I wanted to try to capture that. Huh. <laughs> I can relate. Um, uh, but do you think that this like pursuit of perfection um, is a symptom of of their age or of or of our age? Like, have we all just been expect? Is there something novel to our uh, like we deserve perfection or, or we we are compelled to achieve it? I don't know if this is. I haven't lived in another age, so I only yeah. know that it seems like a epidemic i have i have a just a pet theory that i'm willing to be wrong about um but that kind of our, our rise of like the the wellness imperative or the perfection imperative kind of coincides with a with a rise of like a feeling of precarity you know like that that this feeling that like we're one job reshuffle away from irrelevance or one one health disaster away from bankruptcy uh and 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 kind of looking for something to like latch onto emotionally that will make us feel better in this situation like I don't know, like the last time I went to the doctor, like I, you know, I was in the waiting room filling out in triplicate forms that I already filled out online. And then I was there an hour later than they promised I would be. And then I got to see the doctor for eight minutes and she couldn't remember what she told me the last time and said all the same stuff. And then I got charged $200 that my health insurance company refused to pay. And like, that's just normal. Like that's just a normal interaction with the healthcare uh, industry. And like, if like the research that I did into like placebo and wellness stuff is any indication, like w what people want really want is to be heard, is to be seen, is to be cared for, is to be touched in a in a in a caring way, and like we're not in a place where very many people get that. And so like I feel like well okay like in that situation like the juice cleanse does not seem like a bad idea. Like if it it means that you it, if if you if it means you have to you get to avoid all that like I'm sympathetic to that. Yeah, and I'm sure it's also a pursuit of control as well mm -hmm. in an yeah. in increasingly uncontrollable world. Mm -hmm. I'm just checking on our time. How am I? What did that mean? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk then about the conspiracy aspect mm -hmm. of this because it is such a big part of the story and, and what happens to Jack in particular. Yeah, yeah. There's a <laughs> there's a section in the book uh, where it's called the needy users and it's it's dramatizing the kind of dissolution of a relationship between my main character and his older father but it's the way I describe it is it's doing it from the point of view of the Facebook algorithms that are making it happen like the algorithms that are themselves pushing these two characters to fight uh, and uh, this is this is this was born um, you know in the last several years when like uh, like I mentioned, like people were uh, people I knew were, were posting to things to Facebook that I found sort of outlandish, and um, and and I would private message them and and be like, 
uh, I don't know, I guess you could call it debunking, but like, you know, just like, do you, do you really believe this? Like maybe read this and, you know, and like we would talk about it and like, because I was kind of friends with the guy, he'd be like, okay, great, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And that did not stop him from posting the same kind of stuff over and over the next time. And then I would write him again and we'd do it again. And then he'd post another thing. And, and then I realized that Facebook was then showing me this content like more than any other content, you know? I noticed one time when I was like writing a message to him because he posted something crazy uh, that that the post was actually three weeks old. And like, and like I just missed it the first time around. And like Facebook, the algorithm was like, don't you want to fight about this, you know? <laughs> and th we all kind of know now that like kind of how the algorithm is working. And there's been some great journalism about this that's come out in the last few years. But like back then, it was really confusing. and. And uh, and the, the 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 platform did not seem to care that I was fighting with my friends, that I was very unhappy and sad about this, and that we were our friendships were splintering because of this, you know. And so, I wanted to put this in the book because I was thinking about it a lot, and it was you know thematically resonant with what was going on in the rest of the book. So, I decided to do a lot of research and like like. Facebook is very hush hush about its algorithms, but it has to patent all of them, you know. And so the patents don't don't include the mathematics, of course, but it includes a description of why the algorithms are necessary and and what what the algorithms do. And so I, I read hundreds of pages of like Facebook patent applications in order to try to understand the underlying math and the and the un underlying incentives that were happening to 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 make this happen. And and so yeah, all of that material has then made its way into the book. I found that chapter just so chilling and but fascinating and really clarifying I mean anybody who's experienced this uh, you know online sort of insanity and been sucked into it like that I, it I've, I've not read anything that really kind of crystallized it in the way that you did so in the middle of this novel it was really remarkable um, I'm jumping around a little bit because uh, as I was preparing for my my questions tonight I was reading some reviews and one of the I think the LA Times headline was um, what did it say? Did Gen X sell out? And then it's way worse than that. And I was thinking about the question of selling out. Um, and if if you would, if if what happens to Jack and Elizabeth is in fact selling out versus capitulating, accepting, growing up. Like if you if you have a view on, on do we all sell out? That's that's it's so funny. I've been uh, that was such a. You could not sell out. I remember, like you know, that was the the Gen X imperative. You know, don't sell out, stay authentic. You know, and yeah, I'd like. But I also remember. Okay, the, so the first, the first concert that I ever paid for was Pearl Jam in like 1992. You know, and I showed up to to see Pearl Jam in my best secondhand flannel, and uh, and like at one point Eddie Vedder like stopped the music, and this was the day before Thanksgiving, and uh, and he's like. He says, so tomorrow you're all gonna go home and have Thanksgiving dinner with your families. And we're all like, boo! <laughs> and he's like, yeah, tell him I said, fuck you too. And we're all like, yeah! Even though I love Thanksgiving with my family, <laughs> like it's like my favorite holiday. Uh, but like even at the time it was just like, no, you're supposed to like, you know, I don't, I don't know, you're selling out to big Thanksgiving. I don't even know <laughs> what we were thinking, but like there was something that was like, you have to be kind of anti that. And I think even at the time, at least I was like, I, I was kind of sort of aware that it was a bit of a pose, you know, because the things I was supposed to hate, I was like, no, that's actually fine. So I, I, don't, I don't know what to call that, if that's selling out, if that's just like getting older, if that's getting a little more um, mature just mellowing I, yeah, I have no idea but like it's a it's a, I think it's a process that <laughs> everybody has to yeah. interrogate themselves there's this I listened to this podcast decoder ring and um Willa Paskin and she it was uh, they had a whole episode about selling out and she and she <laughs> said she was trying to explain oh god who was it was it David Foster Wells anyway you know I exactly like Gen X like you, that was the absolute death and then she was trying to explain to her kids the concept of selling teenagers like the selling out and they were like yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's Instagram influencers and people yeah. get paid to like represent stuff. And it's just, it's a concept that seems maybe to be dead. Yeah, there's this scene in, the, in Wellness where uh, Jack's son is, uh, he does re video game reaction videos on YouTube. And uh, and he's like, and Jack's like, or, uh, the, the kid is about to get like corporate sponsorship for his, for, his, uh, for his feed. And Jack's like, well, back in my day, that would be called selling out. And the kid's like, no, that's just called being good, you know? <laughs> Okay. Oh, that's the signal. 
now, but remind me, I know, we're on a show, I got it twice. And is this the time where we get questions? Thank you. Okay. Anthony Mara would have known. <laughs> 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 Who has questions? Yes. This is a writing process question. Um, your book had so many great details that we talked about tonight. Can you speak a little bit about how you as an author, when you're going through an early draft to the end, how do you focus on what to deep dive into? Like, mm. where, when do you get the inspiration? Like, that's something I want to really give a full picture on. Because there's so much in the book, and not one of it, there wasn't one instance where I was like, when did that get in? Like, it all winds up being relevant, but it's so, so many details. I have to repeat the question, um, which is on uh, your writing process, uh, how do you decide which details to include? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, and like, and especially with the the details that are that are going to be resonant, you know, um, how to find those and how to how to make the right choices about about which ones to like kind of bring in more. Uh, um, yeah, that's, um, I guess like for any for any of those details or rabbit holes, uh, they they have to have kind of two qualities for me. First, they need to be thematically relevant in some way like in uh, like what i what i like to do is kind of take this th take this theme so we've got jack and elizabeth and they're sort of living by a story that m might not apply anymore and so lar more largely it's a book about the stories that we believe in and how the, the stories that we believe can shape and sometimes constrict our worlds you know and so if that's the theme then i like to fragment that and look at it through a lot of different lenses so there's i, I have um you know algorithms and like the placebo effect and wellness culture and even art and art history like you know like what 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 was considered beautiful then left out things that are beautiful but but didn't accord to what was what what the standards of beauty were at that time you know things like that so it has to be first thematically resonant in some ways um, and second it has to I have to feel something about it I just have to be able to I uh, you know have some kind of emotional connection to it and oftentimes that's just excitement like yeah, there's a lot of stuff in this book, but but the way I think of it is just like, look at this amazing stuff I get to share with you. Like, I just, it's like, I feel like a kid who's showing off his toy. It's just like, and this, and this, and and so like, I have to feel kind of excited about it in some ways. Um, and then and then you also have to like, have good voices around you. So you have to have like, a, like a good editor and a good agent who's just like, maybe not, you know, <laughs> which is very, very valuable. So like, there's, there's, you know, plenty of subplots in, in wellness that did not make it into the book because the, you know, I started going down some road and I was like, nah, that doesn't have like the oomph that it needs to have. So it's, I, I wish I had like um, a kind of flow chart for you, but it's mostly just about intuition and feeling. And if I, if I, if I, if I'm writing 50 pages about a subject and I'm still excited about it 50 pages later, that's usually a pretty good sign. Uh, so the question was, um, why did I think uh, Nathan choose to stay off? You used to be. I think, I think we forced you. I was, I wasn't there at the time. But anyway, I think you were briefly on social media around the time of the Knicks, and then um, came to your senses, <laughs> and pulled away. And then, uh, so why did you choose to do that? And then, uh, how did I feel when we got the manuscript? Elated, um, and knowing that he wasn't on social media, that's fine. Yeah, for me, <laughs> that's, I like that's fine. Yeah, I um, I was on I was on I was on the platform formerly known as Twitter for for a while, um, and uh, and 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 I don't know. I I, I left it in two thousand eighteen because I was just kind of disgusted by by 
what it was doing to I, I felt like the like the discourse of our of our you know our, our country um, uh, and then almost as if to prove me right a year later I discovered that somebody had taken my handle and was impersonating me on Twitter <laughs> yeah which honestly when I first found out like I had a little piece of me that was like I'm flattered <laughs> like but they were impersonating me in the most boring way I was like oh you could have done this a little better but it was the the tweets were just like uh, one of them I remember was like. Somebody should really say something about the Christmas season and how much we buy in it. <laughs> I was like, you can do better than that fake Nathan Hill. <laughs> um, but honestly, like one of the reasons I, I left it was because I, I don't know how people who are very famous do it because I feel like with this stuff, I have like the armor of a grape, you know, like I would, I would get like, I would, people would, would, would tag me and, and, and say things like, uh, you know, I've, I've reviewed Nathan Hill's novel on my blog and they tag me and I would want to interact with my readers and, and say thank you. And then I would click over to the thing and it would just savage me. It would just be like, this is the worst, most overrated, you know, whatever. And that really affected me, you know, like it's Being human and all. Yeah, like, and I would be like moping around, and my my wife would be like, "What's wrong with you?" And I'd be like, "Twitter." She's like, "You have to stop doing that," you know. So I left. I, yeah, I left, and then I so I I'm I I now have like placeholder accounts on Twitter and Instagram where I I, I just say I'm not on social media, um, and and my Facebook I could not leave Facebook totally because I I use it to keep up with my nieces and nephews. So like. But you know that period of Facebook where like you met someone once and they friended you the next day. I like all of those people went away and like I I, I I radically reduced my my friend role to like people I'm actually really friends with and like and and my family members. Um and and I, I and I try real hard to never click on anything that Facebook gives me so so I don't like give any money to the platform you know. Um so I'm really so I've just reduced my my footprint my digital footprint f just because because not like people who are on it more more power to you i just m emotionally couldn't do it yeah i have a friend who um <coughs> to weed out her facebook anytime she gets a birthday reminder <laughs> she she uses that as a like a, that's the <laughs> litmus test like do i care about this person's birthday <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, happy really birthday good. you're canceled <laughs> <laughs> i thought that was a pretty good way to kind of thoughtfully weed um other questions oh what it, what's what's one, oh, sorry, one more. It's you. Oh, boy. Oh, sorry. Oh, he two more, two more. We okay. need two more. Okay. Uh, so um, I was born and raised in Florida. It's a weird place. Mm -hmm. How has living there affected your work? How has living in Florida affected your work? Where in Florida did you grow up? Orlando. Orlando, okay. Yeah, I live in Naples. Um, and uh, yeah, I, it, it was unexpected becoming a Floridian. Um, I, I'm, I'm, we're there because my wife uh, plays the bassoon for a living, and the, the, she won a job as the as bassoonist for the Naples Philharmonic. And you can imagine how many good bassoon jobs there are in America. So like, when you get one, you take it, you know. And so we're in Naples, um, and uh, you know we've carved out a really nice life there. And it's it's I mean it is criminally beautiful. You know it's like a gorgeous. It's right on the Gulf of Mexico in the winter. It's like seventy five degrees and like sunshine and no rain for like four months. It's fantastic. You know, um, but it's also oh I don't know. It's it's uh, um, I live in a very very uh, conservative place. Uh, I am not very conservative, uh, and uh, and so that I feel like um, sometimes I'm I'm like wow that's a really really aggressive flag on that truck you know and and and, and, <laughs> and like that happens all the time um and uh uh but in some ways i sort of appreciate it because uh i i'm i i, I feel like I'm, i have access to uh like i don't know like i i have friends who live in 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 in, in new york or, or any other urban place and it's kind of easy to, to it, for any of us to be in a bubble and i feel like i'm in a different bubble and in some ways that's valuable as a writer uh, to 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 be exposed to that more, you know. So I, I feel like I'm I'm not just like preaching to the choir, but I'm I, I would really like like I don't know. I play with a lot of guys. I have this tennis group. I, I play a lot of tennis. I have this group. I'm 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 the one non-conservative in the group, and so like I my reputation is now like they I'm like. I'm like the liberal Dakota ring, you know, and they're just like, what does, what is this? And so I'm just like, I try to be the non-intimidating, easygoing, you know, person that doesn't exist on Fox News or whatever. That's my role. And I sort of like it weirdly. Like I've sort of, it's, it's, it's sometimes kind of uncomfortable, but it's also, it's just like, hey, look at us. We're talking. We can do this, you know, like, yeah. So 
it's you know mixed mixed feelings. I don't like the hurricanes, you know, obviously. Then and and, uh, and and we've gotten hit by two recently, so uh, that's that's no good. But uh, but it, it it has its it has its nice things. Yeah, yeah. Young man. Um, hi there. Hi there. <laughs> so, um, the one thing, I'm sorry, I have not read your book, but the one thing that stands out to me about your cover is the shiny uh, orange triangle mm -hmm. on the cover. Mm -hmm. Today, I feel like I have to ask this question. What is your favorite shape and how does that affect uh, Jack and Elizabeth's favorite shape? I have to repeat it. And that is a great question. <laughs> That might be the best question I've gotten so far on tour. Thank you for that. <clears throat> the question is, uh, 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 um, he had to comment on the cover, and the cover has a triangle on it, and it's a very distinct triangle. And he made me—he's wondering what my favorite shape is, and like if that has any resonance with the with the story. Um, and I, I got to say, my favorite shape is the triangle. Uh, so when the designer presented me with the triangle, yeah, I was like super excited about it because. For two reasons. First, the triangle sort of because there's like a couple inscribed within the triangle, um, uh, and so it almost looks like they're walking down like a red carpet, like into the distance. If you kind of like let your eyes do that, and so I was like, how perfect! It's like here's here's this young optimistic couple going into the future, but then also the triangle I think is a very sinister shape you know it's like it's very cultish you know it's just like it's like illuminati or something and so it's like well yeah this cu this couple is also a kind of cult of two so it like works in both ways you know so i i it was not my idea but when the designer gave me the triangle i was like yes that's it N thank you everybody <laughs> thank you nathan <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Nathan and Reagan, for joining us tonight. Thank you all for being here. Let's give them another huge round of applause. That was a wonderful. Um, if you're joining us on the live stream, buy the book in the link description. If you're joining us here, buy the book at our lovely register. Um, coworker David's going to be back there to sell you every single book we have. Um, you either already have a book or you have a gift card. You can buy more. Um, we're going to have everyone line up down the center aisle for personalizations. Um, my coworker Teo is going to get, like, they're pointing towards the area where Nathan will be sitting and standing and signing. Yes, we're going to have you line up that way. <laughs> You're ready. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're going to have Nathan signing back there. Teo's going to come around with uh, post-it notes to get the spellings of your name correctly. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Please grab your personal belongings as you head out and have a great night. <laughs>